Grab your favorite alcoholic or non-alcoholic beverage, drink responsibly, do not drink and drive, and join us for the latest episode of Why Complain When You Can Wine. Everything in this podcast is purely for entertainment and psychoeducational purposes only. Enjoy! (laughs) Welcome to Why Complain When You Can Wine, making sense of the senseless. Join us as we attempt to make sense of toxic nonsense while drinking wine or whatever beverage you so desire, alcoholic or not. I am Dr. (laughs) Sodi Larman, licensed clinical psychologist in the state of California. And anything and everything that we discuss on this podcast is purely for entertainment and psychoeducational purposes only. And tonight we have had, I am in Southern California. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but we have had a shit ton of rain. It has rained nonstop. My pool has like a... One wall is higher. And then when you go around, it's got like a cement thing. It's slowly creeping. If it doesn't stop raining soon, my pool is going to overflow. Mm-hmm. So, And my street floods in the front. So we just stayed home today, got a lot of work done, but yeah, it's mm-hmm. coming down. Thank goodness or knock wood, it is not windy because mm-hmm. we're supposed to get up to 60 mile an hour gusts. And if we did last night, I didn't hear it. I slept through it. So that's good because it does, it gets very windy. I live in the foothills. Mm. it's very windy to begin with so well I live in Vancouver so I live in a rainforest (laughs) so we get a lot of rain it's comparable to Seattle yeah well we don't (laughs) we're California we're a desert (laughs) yeah we've been in a drought so luckily between last year and this year hopefully my water bill will go down yes because it is raining I had I thought I had a wine that had a an umbrella in rain but it doesn't but this is close enough it says red drop oh Oh, there you go like a you know like rain you know and it is a dark red blend from california and because last week and going into this week thank goodness not today but it has been a i'm sure you can understand this when i show you this it has been just loads of fun so my glass says this fucking day oh my gosh you're so funny i need to get those mugs i don't have anything that says (laughs) and i do have a mug that says i fucking love you and then i do have one that's even better it says um there's a couple, uh, but my favorite one is if you see me talking to myself, just keep walking on by. I'm, I'm having, I'm, I'm, I'm self-employed and we're having a staff meeting. <laughs> yep. That's so one. cheers. Oh, you gotta yes. yourself. Oh, um, <laughs> my bad. Um, I am, I'm Bree or Brianne, what, however you want to refer to me as, um, Bree, I am a licensed, um, registered, uh, psychotherapist from Vancouver, BC. I am drinking a little bit of Kraken this evening, like I did the last time. I haven't had a chance to go out and actually restock my liquor cabinet. So I'm just just going to dab into this tonight. I really thought about making like something tonight, Mm -hmm. like like a hard alcoholic Mm -hmm. drink. But I decided to just chill for the for the uh, 30 minutes that I had before this time. So I'm like, I'm just going to drink wine. But oh, my God, I could use some tequila or some vodka yeah. or some rum. Not this time, but cheers. Oh, um, cheers. Cheers, lovey. Cheers. So, Dr. Larman, what are we going to discuss this evening? Well, I've already seen it and you are watching it. You're watching. Oh. Is it shrinking? I, I finished. I okay. finished it. So, oh. mm-hmm. so no spoilers or anything. Okay. Oh. So this is basically, <laughs> I, my, I take issue. I love watching, but I take issue with how mental health is portrayed on TV, in the movies. And it's oftentimes portrayed in an extremely unethical way that mm-hmm. makes it seem as if this is what mental health truly is. Mm -hmm. So we both watched Shrinking. Good show. I really liked it. But the whole time, I'm just like, I hope people. Well, that's the problem, (laughs) right? Because that's not the real world. And a lot of people, and I, I, we both know this, of course, take TV and movies and stuff as as like, like literally, right? Um, If you haven't seen the show Shrinking, it's got Jason Segel and then a a few other um, characters in it. Oh, and uh, Harrison uh, Ford. Harrison Ford. Oh, so great. Um, in it and that's why it's so funny is because Harrison Ford is just like you know it's Harrison Ford and it's like if this is a satire sort of show on psychologists therapists right um but 
to a lot out there that don't really recognize or have never been to therapy or whatever might take this literally and not with a grain of salt. And unless you read that it's satire, like if you read the description of the show, if you just start watching it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not played as satire. I mean, yep. it's not corny or campy or anything like that. It's seems like this might actually be real. Yeah, legit, but actually funny. Like it's funny as hell. The show is so funny. I mean, I that's where the 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 comedy piece kicks in, right? Especially when you're seeing Harrison Ford. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna spoil this one part, but it just kills me when they talk about he talks about raw dogging and he has no idea what that is. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a full blown psychologist. And then finally get to at the end or like, should we just tell it what it is? <laughs> like it's really quite funny. Like it's actually quite humorous, but you also have to recognize that the way that these actors are portraying psychologists, no psychologist could ever ethically behave the way that they're behaving or acting on in the show as licensed clinical professional PhD doctors. I don't even think any kind of ethical there, therapist in general. No, I couldn't. There's just no way. Like you watch Jason Siegel's character and how he, you know, he's just struggling with his own personal stuff. And then as a therapist doesn't have those boundaries in place and flips out and does what you are not allowed to do with <laughs> clients or patients. Right. So I, I know that the, when I very, very first started at school for my graduate, and maybe it was my undergraduate, but I know in my graduate, one of the things that they teach us is you leave your feelings at the door, any crap shit, Anything that's going on yeah. in your life, you leave it at the door. Now, we're not robots. We are human. So we do have bad days. But we are not supposed to be giving those bad days to our clients. Mm -hmm. My clients, all of my clients, I'll say, how are you? And, you know, they're like, good. How are you? And no matter how I am, I am not going to say. I'm going to say, I'm fine. It's great. I'm not going to be like, well, you know, this is going on with me. It's not my <laughs> no and i'd like to say that this is just on tv but i have mm -hmm. seen enough tiktoks about people saying their clinician what is it um turns it around and uses therapy for their own personal oh, whatever yeah so i i know i have it's not a phobia, but I have this fear now ever since being on TikTok, I will talk to like my clients will ask me a question. And it's like, um, I was having some construction done and my, my gate opened, but I didn't know they were coming. And I hear the gate open. I'm like, Oh my God, hold on a minute. Someone's in my backyard. <laughs> I think, you know, and they're like, Oh, what, you know, okay. And then I come back and I go, okay, it's, it's all good. And they're like, Oh, what are you doing? And I'll, I'll tell them sometimes. But then I also say, look, this is your session. And I really don't want to find myself on a TikTok with somebody recording saying, my clinician's only talking about herself. Yeah, well, I've run into that myself. I've seen clinicians myself that often revert and talking about themselves all the time. And I find it to be so strange because it's the one thing, kind of the fundamental thing as a therapist that you don't, you're not supposed to talk about yourself. Now, with regards to relatability and relating to your client, you can often use examples of yourself so that you are being able to build a, a, a greater tighter bond and a trustworthy relationship where they can relate you can relate to them they can relate to you where it creates a safer space for them to be vulnerable that's the only time that you should be using any of your own personal issues examples some old school clinicians don't agree with this at all but sort of the new and I mean I work specifically in trauma right so and I also work with like you know re abuse recovery and different things I can relate to my clients quite a bit. And when they're struggling with trust and they're so apprehensive and they're struggling to be vulnerable, part of building that relationship can be like, yeah. are you comfortable if I share something with you? Just so you can feel like I'm yeah. a safe, right? Only that. And it's very brief. And unless they ask further questions, this isn't about me. There's a purpose behind you disclosing. Sounds um, orient theoretical orientations. There is mm -hmm. no self-disclosure. No. Oh, nope, there is psychoanalysis, Freudian, psychodynamic. Yes. I Freudian no is not about self-disclosure at all. But no, no. I will. And I, what I do with my clients too, is if I say, do you mind if I share something and I'll tell them, but then I also say, I will give you this time back. 
if mm -hmm. we end up discussing and I feel like we're discussing me, like they ask me more questions or whatever, mm -hmm. I tell them, so I've talked for three minutes. I will give you those three minutes back. That's amazing. At least you get, yes. Cause then you don't feel like you're taking away from the client or the client doesn't feel like they're yeah. like, wait a minute. I'm, I actually went to a psychologist and that's what happened. It was like bizarre by the, but, and I was already a I'm licensed therapist at the time. And I'm like, why did she spend over? It was a long session. She was doing a lot of neurofeedback and linguistics. And she spent like an hour and a half of that day talking about her own personal stuff and her own stories and her own. I'm like, okay, I know that we can relate to one another, but a lot of it was her venting about her own. <laughs> like, like, that's fascinating. But I'm here. But I'm paying you fourteen hundred dollars. It's like for I'm quite a therapy for 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 my mental. Health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly right. And you just kind of shocks you a little bit. But um, getting back to the show and and then the way that TV portrays. I know Dr. Lerman, you're trying to get me to watch The Shrink Next Door. Is that what it's called? Yeah, because I want to see that one too. That but... is based on a true story. Yeah. And stop right here just to say if anybody has seen it. I really want to discuss it. It is based on a true story about a psychiatrist, thankfully not a psychologist, about a psychiatrist. And everybody knows I have issues with psychiatrists. But mm -hmm. um, honestly, this is the only spoiler I will give. It's based on a true story. And the true story is actually worse than the what they show on TV. I've heard that. I've heard that because I've heard it's based on a true story and true events. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... <laughs> Oh my God, please. The reason why I want people, I want you to watch it and I want people to watch it because that also shows you how insidious NPD is and how they worm their way in. So it's mm -hmm. not like they don't hit you in the face with NPD. So for all the people that are like, why didn't I see it? How come I didn't know on and on? This is a really good unraveling of that type of how things can happen that way mm -hmm. so often people with deal and sociopaths can fool therapists all day long oh yeah but the, I have, I had the a psychiatrist is the npd sociopath oh, yeah but there is a lot of doctors yeah. and a lot of people that have that personality structure right and that's how insidious they can be i'm not gonna lie folks i mean it does happen out there and this doesn't discourage anybody from going and seeking treatment or therapy but i had a therapist that hit on me literally like it was gross it was my marriage it was the I was divorcing my husband and my ex-husband and he literally made such an inappropriate comment that it just was and he knew it was offside but that was the end of that it was like crossed every ethical boundary and knowing that I was leaving a very toxic relationship your license see we oh, they are psychiatry excuse me mental health professionals mm -hmm. overall our guidelines with in California, especially with confidentiality and all of that, be prior to HIPAA, we had HIPAA came and it was just a blip because we were mm -hmm. over and above HIPAA because we are dealing with the most vulnerable. They're mm -hmm. giving us the, their secrets, their everything. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the whole point. Healthy. Yeah. Yeah. So the power, honestly, and mm -hmm. any clinician that doesn't feel this way, I think is wrong. The power that we hold you can't mm -hmm. take that lightly. Well, that's the problem because they're in such an authority position as, as, and somebody that there's so much secrecy and, or not, I shouldn't say that's not the right word, confidentiality and about, um, or, or that relationship and that it's supposed to be such a safe place. This guy literally used his, oh, I'm on the board of the feminists at UBC and, and University of British Columbia. And I have my PhD in, um, you know, um, social work. And he was like all, all this stuff playing him self out to be women's rights and activists for women yet he's making sexual inappropriate references he to his license for that oh no he has the worst reputation he's been reported he's been he what? he's no not being an ethical practicing practitioner at all and so here's the deal people um that's it's pretty evil it's pretty it's pretty you know abusing your authority and your power like that especially as a person that's supposed to be the pinnacle of help and safety and security but people are people lots of surgeons are narcissistic they have that god complex right doctors can be the fucking worst when it comes to the ego and the narcissism and it's and it's rampant right it, yet they work in a field where they're supposed to be endless amounts of empathy and helping people and they're not look at us some they have no bedside manner they're academically gifted 
and they can get the grades and they can do it and they can understand. But when it comes to actually treating another human being, they have no clue. And they're, they're narcissistic up at the, up the wazoo. So people are just people. So yeah. continue the red flags appropriately. regardless. Thing, yeah, if, if you go to therapy, I tell this to, I, I say this all the time. You're allowed to clinician shop. Mm -hmm. You're allowed mm -hmm. to the best predictor of outcome in therapy is the rapport between the client and clinician. Hundred percent. Credentials are extremely important. You want someone that's licensed in whatever mm -hmm. level, masters or doctorate. You want someone that's licensed. You want someone with training. I'm sorry, but you don't want a life coach, not for therapy. No. You don't want a coach, not mm -hmm. for therapy, and you don't I want somebody that has gotten their certification in CBT from Udemy or whatever. Those are more for continuing education for clinicians already. For clinicians. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Not for somebody who's like, not for just a random Joe Blow that can take it. No, you got to be really careful again. And it's not to discredit life coaches. There's people that are actually legit life coaches that have the proper credentials to life coaching. A life coach. A life coach is not the therapy. therapy. It's different, right? Yeah. Again, their overall goal is, is like incorporating and work and different and different things where a therapist is, is somebody that goes into the past, the present, the future, the all the things, right? Deals with mm -hmm. your vulnerabilities, your mental health. People don't understand. Mm -hmm. And this is why when knowing that shrinking and watching that, and again, I it was a great show. I, I'm not bad mouthing the show, but what I'm saying is mm -hmm. people look at that and that also does give them this poor opinion of, of psychology and clinicians, because I don't want to pour my soul out to you. We get told things that people probably swore they would take to the grave and they're telling, oh, absolutely. you mm -hmm. know, and then to have someone, honestly, so many people have had their, especially in toxic relationships, have had their words and feelings weaponized and yeah, they I don't it. need a clinician to do that as well. No, they don't. That's why this show was kind of like no, no, no therapist logistically, ethically, morally would ever treat their patient like that. And if they do, they would probably lose their license pretty quick and they would have the worst reputation and no client, client would stick with them. And the fact that all his clients sort of stayed with him, regardless of how he sort of dismissed them and because he was struggling with his own stuff. Big um, time struggling yeah. with his own stuff. Yeah, <laughs> huge. And right and rightfully so, but then probably should have taken a sabbatical. Yeah. and a break so he dealt with his own stuff but like yeah you don't you know oh my god we've been working on the same issue for two years like he doesn't care he abuses you he's using you he's a misogynistic whatever and then blasts her and you're like what and you know it's okay to say you need to make a decision let's mm -hmm. talk about why you're stuck but he mm -hmm. tells her i'm done being your clinician if you don't yeah. that, if you don't leave him yeah and i'm firing you as a client yeah and you know i mean i <laughs> I know it's crazy. My, crazy. Well, okay. That is, uh, the technique that you can use is not mm -hmm. firing them as a client, but by saying things like, obviously you're in this for something. Mm -hmm. Let's explore that. What are you gaining from it? Or what is it stopping? Or what is it? Whatever. But, oh my God. And there was a point where she left him, her boyfriend, yep. but then she went back he ran into the boyfriend. See, that's another thing too, is I, our clients should not, we, we don't talk to our clients. I have told clients that I know live nearby. I said, look, if you see me, I'm not going to say anything. Right, I'm can't. not going to be rude. Nope. I am. I'm, if you say yeah. hi to me, I'll say hi back. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be rude. And having a conversation because it's out of context. And again, for their confidentiality purposes, you know, it's protecting them. It's not yeah. even so much protecting you. It's protecting them because of the people around, like maybe their mom or their brother or their husband doesn't know that they're in therapy. And then who are you? And then you're like, oh, hey, are you coming to my, like, no. You got a session tomorrow or sorry, I missed the last one or anything. And if I see you outside of the office or outside of our sessions, you know, I, if you say hi, I'll, I might say hi back, but again, I'm not going to engage in conversation because it's not ethical. No. Right. And that's to protect you. And if anybody in your family, anyone who does not have a release of information, 
they're not going to even know you're in therapy. Like I've had people say, well, what if my daughter, son, sibling, husband, whatever contacts you because they want some information. I said, I, I'm going to ignore the email because mm -hmm. I can't confirm or deny mm -hmm. that you're in session and no. saying, I cannot respond to your email is kind of confirming. Yeah. So I can't do that either. So if they try to, I'm, I can't, I can't respond. No, nope, it's Anything. unethical. Yeah. 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 And I try to get releases for like pretty much everything if I can, even when I don't necessarily need one, like someone wants their significant other, but they're not married to come to session. I will say, okay, can you sign a release of information just in case they want to come by themselves? Mm -hmm. Even though they're in session together and I can get a verbal confirmation, it's okay for them to be there. But still it's like, I want, if I can, if I can, everybody to sign releases of information because I don't you know. I just had this in a supervision, um, last week with my supervision group. Right. So up in Canada, like, it, you know, we're required to, um, have ongoing supervision every year and then continuing ed credits and everything to keep our license active. And I was in a supervision group and I brought up that very point about, especially with couples counseling. And this is for everybody, just so you know, so you're aware. Okay. Um, therapists are always put in very compromising positions when you're working with a family or you're working with more than one person. Because if you're working with the entire family and then you work with them individually, triangulation can happen very easily. It's the one, one thing that we, um, as are trained is, is that a lot of people will sign a disclosure or therapists will say, I won't work with you individually. If you're coming to marriage counseling or couples counseling, because then if one person, for example, this is just one example, infidelity has happened and they're telling you in confidentiality, which is your job as a therapist to keep that confidential, then, you know, then you're working with the group and this person says, you can't say anything because I'm not going to tell them that there's no honesty and transparency. And when you're working with couples, honesty and transparency is key to get the relationship moving in the direction. And now, you know, something that the other person doesn't know they're at a disadvantage. This is what we call triangulation. And it's a and very lying too. They're lying. Exactly. And so it's an unethical position they're putting you in, but lots of therapists will dif disagree. And so when I said, and I was just sort of empathizing with another clinician, because she kind of got caught in this situation where a husband disclosed that he's going to divorce his wife, but not to tell the wife. And it was just sort of a shitty thing to be like, and then, then, then he leaves and he left the conversation. And then that was sort of it. And I said, it's sort of like that rule of thumb when you're working in couples counseling or even family counseling is, is that if you're going to work with individual people, that there's no secrets. Mm -hmm. Like if you close something to me that is pertinent to your marriage and the success of your marriage and the healing of your marriage, you know, you can, it, everything kind of has to be on the table or I, I will not work with people individually. Right. And I had a clinician fight back. She's like, I have, shall I have a real problem with what you just said? And I was like, okay. Oh tell and then she said well I live in a small community and I work I'm the, I'm the only therapist here like I work with everybody and there's sexual abuse going on I can't disclose that I can't it's our job to hold on to all of that information and it's our job to be like hold that confidentiality and it's not about us and how we feel and our level of discomfort and then I I you know I just I politely intervened and said I totally understand what you're saying but I think you're missing the point of what I'm saying it's not about holding information and that it's our job and that we aren't disclosing that it makes us uncomfortable. It's an ethical issue. Yeah. Because you know, also that this therapy right now isn't genuine and real because mm -hmm. one person is holding withholding and you know, they're withholding and then you can't say anything. A actual piece of information that, that pertains to the marriage yes. and the yeah. of the marriage and the, tra and the, and the, the function of the marriage. Yeah. I mean, and it's not like they're disclosing, okay, well, I was sexually abused as a kid and my my spouse doesn't know, you know, that's a lot different with holding that information and obviously keeping it confidential. But when somebody discloses to you that I'm having an affair and I have no intention of telling my spouse and you're in marriage counseling and you're working with both people, it is an unfair position you're putting. The and it's triangulation and the therapist then has to, you're always being put in these compromising type situations, right? But I don't know, per perspective, I guess, but lots of people would disagree, especially if you're in a small community and you're working as kind of the sole therapist. And But then uh, you also have like, because I'll work with, I've worked with individuals mm -hmm. with marriage issues that, that were trying to do marriage counseling, but they couldn't find anyone. I said, I will do marriage counseling. 
but then it becomes marriage counseling, not individual counseling. It changes. And right. I've had marriage counseling where it doesn't work out. One person leaves and I end up doing individual with the other person. Mm -hmm. Well, often what you'll find, I went through marriage counseling personally and he wanted to see us individually. But then what happens is, is that they obviously the therapist has to empathize with you. So the spouse uses that as a weaponizing tool, then goes back and says, but they told me this and they totally agree with me and you're wrong and you're, and then that creates conflict, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Tricky, tricky because territory. I've had couples where couples counseling. Okay. This is a little off the original topic, but I do have to say this. I enjoy couples counseling mm -hmm. most of the time, <laughs> but I have had couples where one, when I'm seeing people individually and um, marriage issues are part of their stuff, I will mm -hmm. say, would you like to have your spouse come so that, mm -hmm. cause I've had people like my spouse doesn't think I'm working on this and this and this. And it's like, it's not up to your mm -hmm. spouse. It's up to you, but mm -hmm. do you want them to come and give their perspective? So I will have the spouse come. Cause I have heard literally, I'm not kidding. 180 degree different stories. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, you spouses, and then it's like, Right? But I've also had where I'm in therapy and I will, I'm, and I tell them, this is not about taking sides. This is not about placing blame. This is about trying to repair something to move forward. If that's what you guys want mm -hmm. or to decide whether you're not going to stay together, but it's not I about blaming anybody because that's no. not going to do anything, man. Mm -hmm. I've had people, I am not kidding you. When I say this, I had one party email me saying, why did you agree with the other party? It's like, what do you mean? Well, mm -hmm. you, you, you agreed. You said, yeah, I get it. And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. this is a whole other problem. Mm -hmm. But that's just, but that's what they do, right? Because they cling yeah. in the short and they, and again, that's where it becomes really tricky if you're going to work with couples. And this is just so many different modalities of therapy. And honestly, you have to be an experienced therapist to do any sort of family or, um, couples counseling because you have to have a very strong demeanor of keeping everybody even keeled you have to be the mediator so again you have to have a strong presence where you're not going to tolerate abuse going back towards spouses that are fighting and in the heat of the moment and you have to be incredibly validating to both people and be able to then get them to see what you're doing right so it's I've had I did have a, a couple though where I literally I won't say you need to leave you need to stay anything like that that's not my you know, unless there's abuse going on, but I did have one couple where she came by herself one time and I was like, he is showing some strong NPD traits. I'm just letting you know. Mm -hmm. And she's like, yeah, I know. I know. I, that's why I need to leave. I need to, I need to get the strength to get out. But she a hundred percent agreed that mm -hmm. that was, I mean, when I saw them the first couple of times, you know, like by the second time I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's hard, especially when you yeah. can see often if I have clients that are in that situation, I will ask them the questions and say, how do you see that that what, what does that behavior mean to you? Like what what does that signify to you? And how does that make you feel and then point out and then they start really questioning and going, Oh, right. Oh, yeah. And then I usually, you know, if they say what does that? Well, this is what this means clinically. And that's what you're probably looking at rather than actually necessarily telling them flat out. It just depends on the dynamic with the client, but usually they can come up with the conclusion where you're just asking all the right questions so they can sort of start to figure oh, yeah. it out. She, this, this, this one, this woman, she was like, she, cause I said, you know, over the years, she's like, this is consistent. This is always like this. This is what I figured. Yeah. It's nice mm -hmm. to have confirmation, but I'm just like, yeah. Right. Hey, this personal also I'm just kind of in my crawling just going what a fucking douche in my head but I'm just like yes I get it I understand bastard you know I mean I would never do that but you know you have to and that's another thing Jason Siegel says what he means yeah. says what he means and you 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 can't do that no you can't no you can't do that we can think what we think all day long but we can't say it yeah right no, not at all. And then social media, that's another one, right? So we're looking at TV and we're looking at movies and different things. I mean, people, you got to take it with a grain of salt. It's not necessarily the way that that therapy goes, especially if there's like that satire element to it, right? Just know that and don't let it deter you away from seeking 
help if you're exactly. on the fence because that again I think that's where your probably your aggravation comes in to Jody is, is that you're trying to get people to seek out treatment because that's what people and we need to get past that stigma with mental health and all the rest of it but then we see shows like this and you're like great my therapist is going to judge me nine ways to Sunday and they're going to boot me out of their office yeah no that's not what we do we have you would not believe regard. you would yeah. not believe and because I was surprised by this how many times I have heard some form of oh my god you probably hate me now I'm like I'm sorry wait what did you just say mm-hmm. I used to say that to the I'm like I don't know yeah. how you deal with I must be so frustrating for you. I'm like, no, <laughs> I, no. Yeah, I know. You no, know? but it was like, I, it, and it's, it makes me sad as well in the sense of we've all been judged at some point in our lives, the vast majority of us. Yeah, um, of course. And if you've ever been in a toxic relationship, you've been judged. Yeah. But to say to, I, it really shocked me. I've been hearing it a lot more not even since, since prison, I would tell them, look, you've already been judged. You've already been tried, convicted. I'm not here to judge you. I would say that, but yeah. to hear my clients sometimes say, oh my God, you probably think I'm stupid. Oh my God. You probably hate me. Oh my mm. God. Are you judging me right now? And I'd be like, oh my God, no. I mean, that was like, yeah, that's the side of abuse, right? Like when you've yeah. been traumatized or you've had abuse and whatever, there's that sort of that structure within your dynamic or your personality where you're so worried that everybody's always looking at you like you're the problem. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I was, I, I will tell people, cause I've had even had people say to me, you know, I grew up in very, very toxic environment and then had this and this and this. So I must be the problem. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, That's Oh my gosh. Thing, right. Do, do, do any of you out there know, um, Dr. Brene Brown, she's one of my favorites. Um, Dr. Larman, do you know who that is? Oh, thanks. So. Really? Dr. Brene Brown is oh she's very she's a uh a social researcher so she's a psychologist and or she's got her PhD sorry social work and um she basically did her whole dissertation on shame and the fundamentals so she's written several books like Braving the Wilderness and Atlas of the Heart um and oh there's another one I just read or whatever but she really focuses on the uh, and she did sociology as well. She's, uh, is shame is the personality, the difference between guilt and shame. And she talks about this a lot and that guilt is, I made a mistake. Shame is I am the mistake. Okay. So this is again, core belief systems that have been built in early childhood. So we can go to attachment theory with that. We can look at so many different various structures, but really shame is the pinnacle of dysfunction within a human being. And again, when you've got healthy attachment or secure attachment, you're more a person who can take, you know, that you're human, you make a mistake with a grain of salt and you can move past it. Somebody who is constantly shame-based or that blamed or abused or, or whatever and their environment has been toxic will be like, there's something fundamentally wrong with me. I am the problem. So they make a mistake and the shame that they feel is unbearable and they beat themselves and the self-deprecation and all the rest of it. Hence as to why when they come to therapy, they're like, you must be absolutely so irritated with me or I am the problem. And the thing is, we've heard so many times if there's issues and there's a common denominator, it's probably that common denominator. Yeah. So, well, all of these things happen because, I'm, you know, I'm involved in all of these. I'm the common denominator. So it must be me. And it's like, that, that, that <laughs> that's mm-hmm. not what I, I understand the logic of that. Mm -hmm. that's not the logic the reality because yes yes, if you go somewhere and you always have trouble at work you always have trouble with your bosses you always have trouble in relationships you're always you can't have friends this that and the other yeah maybe you are the common denominator Mm -hmm. but if you've gone from a toxic childhood and Mm -hmm. maybe got essayed and whatever whatever it's like the I, I will tell people you are the common deni- denominator in the sense that it happened to you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Or that you get in these perpetually abusive relationships as a person why? Been in multiple abusive relationships. Hence as to why that led me to my therapy career is that um, you, and by the way, just because you're a therapist also, I will point out we're, we're not invincible. We are human. We still make the same mistakes. We still struggle with the same shit. 
right? Just so that you know, so that you can honestly have a sense of that we're not fucking perfect. (laughs) We're far from it because we're human, right? We may understand it, right? And we may logically get it on a conscious level, but our subconscious is ingrained. That's where the real change needs to happen. And we all can still struggle with that. This past week was, I was talking to my neighbors outside and I said to them, you know, said, it's a good thing I'm a psychologist this past week because I have been using every single fucking coping skill yep, that, that you've learned in my toolbox. Just oh my to God. My sanity. <laughs> yeah. 120%. But as a person who's been in multiple abusive relationships, I've often had the narcissistic partner just be like, you say the same thing about this guy you're with. And then you say the same thing about this guy you're with. You know, you seem to be the common denominator. You seem to be the problem. See how they reverse and they blame and they, they, they do the whole thing when you're like, yeah, they're right. I am the common denominator for finding toxic people. Not necessarily that I'm the problem, but when you're with an abuser, they will always turn that around and make you the problem. Right. And we will talk about <laughs> Darvo we in will. another podcast. hundred yeah, percent. Darvo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is massive, especially when it comes to that level of toxicity with a, a certain demeanor or type of person, like a narcissistic person, right? Yeah. But going going back to when I said I tell people that you can clinician shop, when you go to your first therapy appointment, odds are it's an intake. It better be an intake, although there may be someone else doing the intake before, depending on like what type of place you are. Because we had, when I worked in community mental health, one person did all the intake stuff and then gave it to the therapist. However, most of the time, the first session is going to be a lot of question and answer. And like Mm -hmm. I tell my clients, I'm going to try to get as much from you, but if I have to go to next time because you are trauma dumping, trauma dump. People have learned from social media, don't ever trauma dump on that first visit. You know what? This is your therapy session. What? Who yeah. says that? Oh, yeah. There was this whole thing I, like the year, yeah, the year before on TikTok. Don't listen to that, people. No. That's not. This is Actually. your therapy session. You want to trauma dump? I have had people that they're crying the whole entire time. Mm-hmm. This is therapy. That mm-hmm. is fine. I will get the information that I need, the basic stuff that I need. And then I'll put the rest away for next week. We do have to get it done. We have to have a thorough biopsychosocial. Otherwise we can't really, you know, it's, we're just working on what you're going at face value. We need to get deeper, your symptoms, all that. Mm -hmm. So the first visit, you might not, you might leave there going. Mm -hmm. But you can also gain so much insight by just listening to a person and how they approach and what they say to you and how, if they come in and they trauma dump, and tells you right away that this person has significant trauma. Hello. Yeah. So now you know sort of what you are dealing with. Right. But we have to for freaking insurance and all that. We have to get oh, yeah, yeah. Like all not, yeah. of those, though, you know, like, mm-hmm. do you use illicit substances? What call it? What level of education? Just the, the minutia. The fundamentals. But I hate that part because honestly, as much as we need to do it, I'd rather do that after I've allowed somebody to gain their bearings with you as a therapist, like let them navigate. So the first time I meet people, I'm like, you know, I got, I had you fill out a little bit of an intake, but it was more like, just like, um, you know, your, your, your personal information and your whatever. And if there's any sort of significant diagnosis that you already have, or if you're on medication, just the bait, very basic. And then I just let them, okay, I'm going to let you run the show here. And I'm just going to sit here and listen to you. If you want my feedback on anything or you want my, 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 whatever, I'm happy to what, but this is where you get to show me or, or start building what you just get to talk and I'm yeah. listen. Yeah. So by the second time I tell people, if you leave there with an icky, ooh, bad vibe, don't go back. Don't, Mm-mm. if Mm-mm. you're like, uh, uh-uh. but if you leave there going, I don't know, go to the next one. See, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that was just a, a an initial now. Mm-hmm. I've had, I cannot tell you how many people I've had say to me, I don't know how to tell my, my clinician that it's not helping. And I tell Mm -hmm. them just say it. 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 I know I personally, after like once a month or every five weeks or whatever, I will say to you, are we going in the direction that you want? Are Mm -hmm. we working on the things that you want? Now I'm Mm -hmm. the navigator. You're the driver. 
But mm-hmm. you can always, I'm not turning left here. And then we mm-hmm. recalculate. That is fine. But if mm-hmm. we are not doing what it is that you came here for, mm-hmm. I would like to know because otherwise we're just sending you adrift and going through the motions. So mm-hmm. tell your clinician, say something. Yes, they are an authority figure in your mind, but we're just people. And well, that's vast, just it. Yeah, yeah the vast and- majority want to know. There's Mm going to be some that don't, there's going to be some that are like, fine, then leave. But Mm -hmm. we want to know, I believe if we're not touching on what you're hoping. Well, again, goals, right. And then reverberate, like a therapist will be able to honestly do a proper assessment, do like what Jody's saying, a biopsychosocial link at, like there's diagnostic assessment. There's lots of different, there's behavioral assessment. Like there's lots of different therapy modalities that therapists will engage in to get a a good idea. The idea is is to identify kind of the schema and people's behavior and what they do. And, and then also symptomatic behavior of certain things that you can get an idea of what that person's struggles are. Everybody's individual and will have different things, but really it's, what do you want out of the therapy? What are your goals? What do you want to change? What is it that you want to work on? What are you struggling with? And then constantly being able to sort of um, conceptualize all of that and then reverberate or reiterate, sorry, re- reiterate that back to the client and just say, do it. Did I hear you properly? This is what we want to work on and touching on that constantly so that you're not getting lost where the client's like, uh, okay, what were my goals again? Like, I don't even remember. Right. I've had people come to therapy and say, I want to work on a mm-hmm. like, okay, we're we'll working on a, but then they never work on it. And I mm-hmm. will say, look, if that's not what you want to work on, that's fine. But you mm-hmm. came here saying you wanted to work on that. So mm-hmm. you're avoiding for a reason. Mm-hmm. Like and we need to investigate. Yeah. yeah. Or you've moved past that and that's fine yeah. too. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I said, be truthful to yourself because you can lie to me all you want. All that's mm-hmm. doing is not benefiting you. Yeah. And, or they can come in with that idea that that's the goal, but then the further they get deeper into therapy, it changes. And then they're like, no, this takes precedence. This is more important. I'd rather work on this. Then we can get back to that. Maybe this leads to that. And that's why I'm struggling with this. And it's all connected, right? Nothing is written in stone. And I tell people, even when I give you a diagnosis, because your clinician, when you go to therapy, they should tell you. And if they don't, you are free to ask, please their credentials, which you should already know when you get there, but you can ask them about their credentials. You can ask them their orientation. You can ask them kind of their background. Like I will tell people, this is my main orientation is CBDT, but I am eclectic. I work with whatever empirically based works with my client. Mm -hmm. And even when I do CBT, it's not the same for everyone. I do give homework. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it is homework just for that week. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's homework. Like I would love you to think about your goals and write Mm -hmm. them down. So we have an idea. So you know, also you're going in the right direction. But I've also had I said, because I've had people that are like, Oh, my God, please don't hate me. I didn't do my homework. And I'm like, honestly, it's for your benefit. There's no, you're not going to be penalized. You're not going to be chastised. It's like, and if I give you homework, and you're like, I don't want to do that. I would rather do this. Mm -hmm. Do it. If you can generate this stuff, do it. I have clients that are like, I don't want homework. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to do anything except for this time. And I tell them this time is not what's going to benefit you. Mm -hmm. But if that's what you want to do, I will Mm -hmm. recommend things. You can take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to kind of guarantee that you're not just going to shut it off Mm -hmm. until the next time we meet, because that's not why you came to therapy. Well, the proof that the more that they just do in session and they're not practicing or they're not using the skills outside of in, in real life, nothing's going to change. And they're just, mm-hmm. yeah. but and then you can say that you've been here for X number of sessions or months or years. And my recommendation was this, but when you don't practice these skills outside, we just sit here and we, and maybe that's all you want, but you're not looking. Right. For- mm-hmm. If that's what you want, I mean, honestly, you're paying for it. Yeah. We've had in case conferences, we've talked about how sometimes we don't feel like we're of any benefit because they're just talking. And it's like, but that's the benefit. If that's what they want and they keep coming back and you ask them and they're fine. Mm-hmm. You know, we are here for, for the client. Mm-hmm. The client isn't here for us. No. And sometimes you're just not going to fit with a client and that is okay. And sometimes 
you're not going to fit. The client's not going to fit with the psychologist. That's okay. But the client, I think the most important thing is the client needs to feel comfortable. Of course. Safety. Yeah. And because number- that's what therapy is all about. Well, our job is to create safety. That's our number one goal is trust and safety, right? Yeah. You have- it's like any relationship. If you don't have those things, it's not going to work. It won't function. And there's different ways. Everybody's got different demeanors. I have the type of client, somehow it works out this way, that are great. Like I have that sweatshirt that says, Shh, no one cares. And I've asked a couple of my clients and they're like, oh, my God, I love it. Now, there are some clients that I wouldn't wear that because they probably wouldn't understand it. You know what I mean? It might be harmful. Not any of the ones that I have, but right. you know, I have clients. You also get to know your clients. I'm not going to right off the bat treat you like I know you, you know, I, you clients are uh, the, the clinicians also feeling you out in the sense of what huh? intuition you're in, you're yeah. using your intuition to gauge who this person is and what you can yeah. and can't get away with. Like I have some clients that need more nurturing and handholding. I have some clients that might need sarcasm and dry humor. You know, everybody's going to be different. And that's why in being a, a clinician and listening, mm-hmm everybody is different hundred mm-hmm. percent person and must be treated. I don't like to use absolutes like must, but as their own individual, like there's no one size fit all. I see all of these things lately. I'm seeing all these advertisements on social media for this solution oriented therapy or whatever. And every client, it works with every client and every problem. Oh, and fuck that. These- huh? That irritates me hearing that irritate. And I will leave a comment saying, please don't say that because that is unethical because there is no one size fits all therapy. No, there isn't. There's no one size fits all orientation. Have any issues and we wouldn't. Yeah, figure- exactly. If you could deal with every single client that you ever get, I've had clients where I'm like, I don't think I'm the best fit for you. No. And it's like, again, that's false advertising. That's yeah. not at all realistic and okay to say. And that is like, you know, you're perpetuating false hope for people. And I think it's unethical and I think it's illegal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there is no one size fits all. I don't know, you, but I haven't had any training for any sort of one side, like solution therapy. That's one, like that's going to cure a person. Mm-hmm. I mean, got it. It takes, like you said, it's the individual, it's the, you know, the, the symptoms of whatever it is that they have. It's the, if there's a disorder involved or any sort of significant mental health issue, what that criteria and what that looks like. And then the individual person is the most important part that you're taking in. And we're all on a spectrum. It's all going to look different. So you can't fit people into a box. It's ridiculous to think that we can. Yep. You can't fit clinicians in a box and you can't fit clients in a box. No. You can't fit depression in a box. You can't fit anxiety in a box. You can't fit schizophrenia in a box. It's all treated similarly. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. why we have techniques and stuff, but Mm -hmm. different. You modify the technique. You modify the technique depending on the, based on the person and based on their individual needs. And I mean, I, I often mix my techniques. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Use CBT and then I use DBT and then I use person centered or I use more of a a gestalt there. Like it just depends. Then. technique is again and you know like finding that i think that this modality um is more helpful than this one or i feel like today i think this is going to be a better approach if i kind of you know we take them and they get them to see that they have different parts of themselves so a person centered carl rogers like his there's just so many different modalities that if you learn you're taking the individual and you're working and you're and it's changing all the time and then you find the best one that fits and the stuff that where they go oh my god now it clicks i get it I was doing CBT for so long and it was great, but now this DBT thing seems to work better. Or I feel like CBT is more my route and I could never really wrap my head around, but it just depends on the person. Like using Gestalt, because I use the unsent letter yeah. all the time, which is Gestalt, Gestalt yeah. all the time. I yeah. use uh, Radical Acceptance. Yes, I CBT, love that. And I use CBD, CBT. Mm-hmm. I use CBD too, but CBT, (laughs) but what's really, really great though, is I have clients and this is like, I want to just like, like, woohoo, we celebrate it. I've had clients that have told me that the techniques that they've used, they've actually, they're like, I know it worked because I had so-and-so and and they were going through this. And I, I, I told them, you need to use this technique. Try this. I did it for, they did it for homework. Right. And they Mm -hmm. gave homework to their friends. I love that. 
it working for them. And I'm like, see, see that's, Yay, that's, 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 a, that's a win for us. We love that. We absolutely love that. And secondly, here's the thing. They should be teaching CBT and DBT skills in school at an elementary preschool. Like these are life skills, guys. Like if you can learn these coping strategies and these coping skills, you'll be able to go up against every difficult in what you would think is an intolerable situation in life differently yeah yeah right so yeah yeah well that one I know you're like I I hate rat and it is it's one of those things where you know but it's especially when you lack the control of a situation and I know we talked about radical acceptance last time but even in my own life I've had to use this so many times so I don't go out of my skin in anger and bitterness and resentment because of the injustices that I've, I've, I've gone through. I have to, I don't have any choice and really staying in that bitter, angry place doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah. So again, this, these skills are, and they found that these, these therapies and these modalities have become so much more generalized where originally they were created or they only worked, they only use them in so many different settings. CBT was originally only used in depression or for depression. CBT or DBT was only used for highly suicidal and borderline patients. And now it's, they're used more for everything, depression, anxiety, like you name it. Well, right? even the orientation of eclectic, because mm-hmm. when we do our notes, we have to put what orientations we use. Mm-hmm. Not put every, but we just put like one or two mm-hmm. if we're doing something. But eclectic is there now mm-hmm. because like, and I've said this for a long time, I don't stick to one thing. Yes. No. It's my, like, for example, my colors, you know, I will wear a lot of charcoal gray. Mm-hmm. That's kind of my base in the winter, but do right. I stick with only that? No, obviously not. So same thing with orientations. If you only stick to one, mm-hmm. If you get a therapist, if you get a clinician who it's kind of the same thing over and over and over, I've had people that said they went to trauma therapy and now they were ready to move on, mm-hmm. but the clinician was a trauma therapist, so didn't know how to move on Right after the trauma was worked through. So everything was also brought back to the trauma that no matter what happened, well, today I had a really bad day. Well, that's because of the trauma. It's like, no, no fuck, it's not, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not. No. So you're actually a good trauma therapist. You know, that that doesn't, that's not the case. Right. But speaking as a trauma therapist, then, you know, when it's kind of time to maybe now we're out of my scope, you got that with someone else. Yes. Somebody else, if they're still having issues, I mean, I don't just work as a trauma therapist. I work, I work in, 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 in a lot of different things, but it's sort of my niche and it's my passion. Like I really gravitate to, um, or want to work with people who struggle with things like, you know, complex trauma and, um, especially coming out of that certain type of insidious abuse, right. Mm -hmm. With narcissism, it seems to be the favorite term of the century (laughs) or the more, right. Because it's becoming more well-known, but, um, it's more or less when people are doing good and they come to a therapy session and they're like, I don't really know what to talk about today. Right. I don't really have anything. I feel really content. I feel really good. That's where you can just give them the option and say, you know what? Maybe it's time that you just, because our goal really is, is not to be working with people forever. Yes. It's got to, you got to cut the relationship, right? And it's hard. It's hard on the therapist. It's and it's hard. For it's, it's bittersweet. It's bittersweet. Like, like, I'm yeah, you're doing because so well. you build such a beautiful bond with these people yeah. and these people, and you have such an intimate bond with them. I, and I don't mean in a sexual way. I mean, just like, again, vulnerable and all of this thing that it's, it is a hard thing. It is very bittersweet, but you know, you've done your job. If people are like, I'm good and you help me a lot. That's amazing. Right. Yeah. And that, Here's the yeah. thing. They will usually come back at some point because when things get hard again and life comes up, they're like, maybe it's time to check in with my, my therapist again. Right. And I love that too, because I've recently had, it's funny because when my case when I start graduating people and it's like, so sad, I'm working with them. But then old ones, it's, it's knock wood. It's I'm really lucky this way. Like if I'm going to graduate two or three clients, Oddly enough, two or three of my old clients would be like, do you have any opening? Cause I just want to come for, you know, is it? to check in or whatever. And it's like, wow. Okay. I've had people like, and I say to them, it's funny. Cause they're like, Hey, Dr. Lerman, I haven't talked to you in a while. Where are you now? And can I go? And I, and I tell them, it's like, I want to say nice hearing from you, but at the same time, this is therapy. So 
and people are usually in distress. So I don't really know how to say, Hey, nice hearing from you. So I don't want to sound rude if I don't <laughs> say that, you know, right. but most right. of the people say I'm not in any distress. I just need a refresh. I, and I tell people too. That's amazing. And that's, that comes down to, again, healthy levels of, um, you know, like, again, I, 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 mental health is not faux pas. It's not a bad, it's not this stigma yeah. around it. It's like such bullshit. We all need it. Every, yeah. it should be mandatory that everybody has a therapist to check in with and call, as a therapist, I have my own therapist. I have to, how the hell am I ever going to get better and continue to grow and gain any sort of introspection and further introspection and knowledge if I don't have people that I need to check in on my, my stuff. But it's not even, cause you use the term getting better. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't like that. Cause that means that you're not. Well, I, like to say is, I know, I know what you're saying, I'm just good on semantics, but what it is, is we also, we take a lot in emotionally because mm -hmm. believe it or not, we don't dwell on our clients like 24 seven, but mm -hmm. I think about my clients, there'll be things where it's like, oh, this would be great for my client or something will pop into my head. Oh my gosh. Now I know what I can, you know, tell, and I'll write mm -hmm. stuff down sometimes or make little notes and, in, in not with names or anything, but just like, oh, mention this or whatever. But I think about my clients. I hope my clients are doing well. I don't just turn off. No, we don't. We don't their... ever do that because again, they become ingrained. But there's also what we call a therapist and Dr. Larman can attest to this as well as, as empathy burnout. Yes. Because they are very, by nature, extremely, you have to be an empathetic person to be any sort of therapist. Like you just have to, you can't. You're supposed to anyways, unless you're faking it because you're a sociopath, but <laughs> you literally have to have that is and in frontline workers in, in hospitals and emergency and therapists, we all have what we call eventually empathy burnout. Uh, when I watch and I read a lot of Dr. Marsha Linehan's work and she's the founder of DBT therapy. And she just said, the part of DBT is being a therapist is you have to have a team of people to take care of one another because of the high level of burnout because you're dealing with the most difficult people and clients and patients. They're highly suicidal, highly self-harming or severe, you know, pathology with borderline or any sort of, it, it's, it's challenging. It's really, and it, it, it becomes very taxing on you. So that's yeah. why you have to have a team of people to make sure. And you check in with that's part of the, the therapy modality and staying true and honest to the, the therapy, the modality itself and what that in, conceptualizes and also what it, what it takes in order to keep working with people. She chose to work with the most difficult people because she was one of the most difficult people, right? She shares a story. It's pretty amazing. And I mean, pretty hard as a PhD doctor, social psychologist and researcher who founded one of the most amazing forms of therapy to be told by her colleagues never to share her story of, of her highly suicidal self-harming behavior because how it would make her look and for her to come out in 2011 and say, I don't want to die a coward, but the reason why I, this was born and how I came, it came to be was due to my own personal experience. Yeah. Right. Well, just piggybacking off of that really quick. And then we're going to have to wrap it up is, um, we also, because we're human, Mm -hmm. There are things that will be told to me that I'm like in my head going, oh my God, that is exactly what I went through with my ex. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't trigger me anymore necessarily, but that's another reason for having a therapist or someone because we need to then turn around sometimes and go, oh my God, oh my God, this happened today. I need to discuss it. Mm -hmm. you know? So for clinicians to have clinicians. So oh no. So. We have to, because that's yeah. exactly how we stay. That's a part of our self-care. Yeah. Like we have to have a lot of self-care because of our job can be very emotionally intense. Right. Oh, and so, just like working in a prison. I wish we could have put a camera in our office. because. Oh God, I can't even imagine. Prison. But we had to have humor and all of that because of the stuff that we encountered. No kidding. Yeah. Right. It's like that gallows humor and that black humor is yep. really hospitals. And my dad was a firefighter for years. And he says, oh yeah, we always... It's how we coped, right? Yeah. And yeah. you can't do it outside of your circle because they would not understand. No, they um, wouldn't. No, not at all. So just 
just like to wrap up when you see things in social media or on TV or in media with therapy, oftentimes it is not an accurate portrayal of therapy. Watch that shrink next door or the shrink next door because that is an actual true story. And I would love to discuss that. Yeah. Um, but when you go to therapy, if you go to therapy, and I truly, like you said, I believe we have to have a diagnosis to bill insurance. So mm -hmm. I wish they had preventative therapy mm -hmm. so that somebody doesn't get a diagnosis. Like mm -hmm. I'm coming because I don't want to be depressed. Mm -hmm. I'm coming because I don't want adjustment disorder. I want to cope with this in a mm -hmm. better way. I'm coming because I'm feeling like if I do this anymore, I will have anxiety. Of you know? course. But I we we have to have a diagnosis. So people mm -hmm. wait a lot of times until there is a diagnosis. Yeah, that's sad. We have a lot of prevent pre preventative therapy here. I mean, I work with lots of people with various different diagnoses, of course, but um, a lot of it is, you know, just coming in knowing that they're struggling with various different things and so that they can not wind up with a diagnosis. In they the come end. in with V codes probably, mm -hmm. which according to insurance, insurance doesn't cover V codes. Like there's a parent child relationship V code. There's all these different kinds of V codes mm -hmm. that I really think need help, but mm -hmm. insurance won't bill. So we have to put mm -hmm. a code. So that's why I'll tell a lot of people it's a mood disorder. You are not clinically depressed. You have mood issues. Don't be, because people are scared of diagnoses too. It's like, don't mm -hmm. be scared. It's not. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so I wish that they had that. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I do believe in therapy even to learn coping skills mm -hmm. period Absolutely. in life. Um, mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to talk to your clinician. Don't be afraid to interview your clinician. You're allowed to interview. Your yeah, no, you, you do. It's a, it's such a personal and again, private and like just very vulnerable situation that you're in that you have to have somebody that you absolutely are going to feel okay with and so I've often said the same thing I'll tell all of my people I'm like if I'm not for you that's okay I would never take offense to it you've got to find somebody that is for you also giving and empowering them right yeah it really it's is a really powerful session the mm -hmm. one thing to remember too is therapy is your session Mm -hmm. You are the one driving. Mm -hmm. I am Siri or the navigator on your phone that recalculates because you drove right. too far past. I'm Alexa. Yeah. <laughs> if you yell Siri, my phone will probably go off. But um, you are the one in charge, yeah, not the right. clinician. And right. going back to shrinking, if your clinician yells at you. <laughs> yeah, don't go back. No. But no. you know, you can also say, I am not coming back because that is completely inappropriate behavior. Mm -hmm. You can say absolutely. that. You absolutely can say that. That's good. Hold people accountable, right? I agree. Accountability in therapy is huge. So that's a good huge. one. Hold your that's clinician good. accountable. We yes. hold you accountable. Yeah, absolutely. So we hold us accountable, that's right? Accountable. This is a good thing, right? Growth. All Great about place growth. to end. Hold yes. your clinician accountable. So as always, click the little bell up in the corner on YouTube that will tell you every time we drop an episode, which is about every two weeks, please leave comments. Tell us what topics you would like. We can go the whole range of topics. I have mm -hmm. a couple that I am like, I want to talk about my pet peeves, anybody's pet peeves, but I want to mm -hmm. spew out my, <laughs> want to talk about communication. Want to talk about that shrink, the shrink next door. Mm -hmm. um, leave comments. You can email us at wcwycw1 at gmail.com. Tumblers that uh, Brie can get. Uh, yeah, yeah. Give me, give me, give me tips, people. I can order where I'm not. You know, I mean, I be in me in Canada in a different country, but we still we can order. We order from the US. You have right? Amazon, right? Oh God, yeah. <laughs> it's like my price, my addiction. I'm not addicted. To oh my God! Or... Really quick, <laughs> Amazon. Total... I, I didn't never had Amazon prime for the longest time. So I would wait till I had like $35 or whatever in my cart before you could get free shipping. So I was very prudent and frugal. Now that I have Amazon prime, it's like, oh, I need this ship. 
Oh, crap, I forgot that. I need that ship. So I get oh like 18 God. different charges. It's on a my problem. Phone. I'm like, what can make me happy? Oh, I'll shop on Amazon. <laughs> and I tell me like, bad. oh, crap, I forgot to buy dental floss at the store. Dental floss. Okay, shit. And then it's like, oh, no, I forgot that Sean needed something. So, yeah. And then I get my credit card. I need that for my Amazon addiction. There you go. It's a perfect reason why I need to check in my account. Spending too much money. I think it's just easy. I think we all need, I think we all, I don't know anyone. Well, I do know a couple of people that don't shop on Amazon, but everybody else has an Amazon addiction. Yeah, I know, right? So, so easy and convenient. I know. So, Anyways, on that note, thank you so yeah. much for joining. Yes. And we will see you guys. Uh, please, we'll see you guys soon, I was going to say. So yeah, everybody, absolutely. And comments, all of that good stuff. Yeah. And have a really good uh, two weeks after this. Mm -hmm. After you hear this, it'll be two weeks. I don't know what I'm saying. I think the alcohol might be hitting. <laughs> I think, I think it's, uh, yeah, we do it every, we post on Monday and then we do usually a podcast on the following Monday. So we yeah. do posting podcast, posting podcast. Posting pod yeah. So you'll see us again in the next two weeks. Yes. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys. Excellent. Stay safe. And yes. um, take care. Talk to you soon. Bye, everyone.